Let's go over the three question warm up for Farm Basics 1. First question What are the different types of collagen and where can they be found in the body? You probably remember this gross mnemonic. You probably can't forget it if you tried. A strong, slippery, bloody BM for the four types of collagen. Type 1 is the strong type, which is found in tendon, bone, dentin, skin, fascia, and the cornea. Type 2 is your slippery type, found in cartilage and the vitreous body. Type 3 is the bloody type, found in blood vessels, granulation tissue, the uterus, and fetal tissue. And then type 4 is BM for the basement membrane, also known as the basal lamina. Next question. A 40-year-old man with a history of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and hypertension presents with a severe headache. A head CT is normal at presentation and examination of the CSF reveals numerous red blood cells. What is the cause of the man's headache? This is a classic presentation for subarachnoid hemorrhage due to a ruptured Berry aneurysm. Remember that Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is associated with Berry aneurysms. Next, how does the presentation of a dominant parietal lobe lesion differ from the presentation of a non-dominant parietal lobe lesion? The non-dominant parietal lobe lesion typically is the right parietal lobe, and that presents with the hemispatial neglect, where you ignore the other side of the world and you don't recognize the other half of your body as your own. And the dominant lobe lesion, which is typically the left parietal lobe, causes Gerstmann's syndrome, which is characterized by agraphia, which is inability to write, a calculia, an ability to calculate, and finger agnosia, which is an inability to distinguish fingers on the hand, and left to right disorientation as well. That's it for our warm up. Now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lewis for the lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Step 1 video. Try to keep your mouth closed during the lecture. Not only will my Han Solo-esque rugged good looks cause your mouth to water, but the material itself will get you slobbering like a Pavlov dog in a bell factory. Don't worry, it'll make sense in a minute. So our first Farm Basics lecture is going to deal with the autonomic nervous system and more specifically the pharmacology of parasympathetic activation. Now in order to understand this, we have to take a brief step back and go over a little bit of the autonomic nervous system. Now as you probably already know, the autonomic nervous system is the part of the peripheral nervous system that helps you to regulate many of our bodily functions. And luckily for us, it does this automatically. Now where our somatic nerves are under voluntary control, uh, for example to flex our skeletal muscles, the autonomic nervous system is unconscious. Now there are two opposing or maybe balancing forces in the autonomic nervous system and these are the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. You'll often hear the sympathetic nervous system associated with activities related to fight or flight uh, and the parasympathetic nervous system is associated with activities related to rest and digest. Now we're going to concentrate on the parasympathetic nervous system for the next two lectures. So where in the body is the parasympathetic nervous system? Well, a couple, a couple of lectures back, we probably talked about the cranial nerves. And the cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10 are all carrying parasympathetic nerve fibers. Now we also see parasympathetic nerve fibers uh, coming out at the second and third sacral spinal nerves as well. But about 75% of all parasympathetic nerve fibers are in the vagus nerve, so cranial nerve term. Therefore, when we think about the parasympathetic nervous system, we're often talking about the vagus nerve and its eventual innervations of organs like the heart, the lungs, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, proximal half of the colon, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, kidneys, upper portions of the ureters, uh, and you know, basically every organ in our body. Now sometimes you'll have this even referred to as vagal stimulation because it's such an important nerve. The autonomic nervous system sends out its messages to the organs by way of two different nerve fibers and ganglion. Now the first nerve fiber is called the preganglionic nerve and it transmits its message to the ganglion. I think of this as sort of like a relay station. Now the message is then propagated to uh, the second nerve fiber called the postganglionic nerve and then it ends at the effector organ. Now the parasympathetic nervous system uses very long preganglionic fibers and the postganglionic fibers are short with the ganglia very close to or within the organ that it's innervating. Now this, uh, in contrast to the sympathetic nerves, which have relatively short preganglionic fibers and very long postganglionic fibers. 
So why is that important? Well, having these long preganglionic fibers and short postganglionic axons uh, allows that parasympathetic nervous system to kind of be more selective uh, than the sympathetic nervous system. If you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, you're basically stimulating the whole system. In the parasympathetic nervous system, one postganglionic nerve is innervating one organ. Therefore, you kind of get a more localized stimulation. Now, the primary neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine. The preganglionic neuron will secrete acetylcholine to stimulate nicotinic receptors at the ganglion. The ganglion will, will then secrete more acetylcholine, uh, which will then stimulate muscarinic receptors on the effector organs. And this is important to know because many drugs exert what we refer to as a muscarinic or anti-muscarinic effect. Now I want to very briefly go over the difference between a nicotinic and a muscarinic receptor. So remember, these are the receptors that we'll see on our effector organs. They're very, very important. Now, nicotinic receptors are ligand-gated sodium-potassium channels. Now, remember that we find these on our ganglia in the autonomic nervous system, but also be aware that the somatic nervous system uses these nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction as well. Now, muscarinic receptors are G-protein coupled receptors that act through second messengers. And there are uh, five subtypes, and they're named M1 through M5. All right, so the next topic is parasympathetic activation. Now, we're going to cover this material using a little bit different uh, teaching modality. We call this the patient profile. So we'll go through a clinical vignette and use it as a jumping point to cover all the high-yield material related to parasympathetic activation. Now, the title uh, of this is going to be Old McDonald Gets Leaky. Let's get started. So we have a 38-year-old man uh, presents to the emergency department with shortness of breath, diaphoresis, and agitation. He has excessive urination and diarrhea. He recently moved to the area and works at a local farm. Uh, physical exam shows constricted pupils, a heart rate of 55 beats per minute, mild inspiratory wheezes, excessive salivation, and muscle twitching throughout his body. What is the mechanism of action of the medications uh, most likely used to treat this patient's symptoms? Okay, so the title of this question might actually give you some clues. And again, the point of this is not to test you on your uh, question answering ability, but to give you a great way to remember all this material. Now, as you read the question, you see a bunch of nonspecific symptoms. You see shortness of breath, you see diaphoresis, bradycardia, wheezing, and excessive salivation. Now, you may have gotten the answer from these combinations of symptoms, but the major giveaway in this question is that he started working on a farm. So a patient working on a farm should cause giant alarm bells to go off uh, in your head. Now, these symptoms all start to have a pattern. Old McDonald got organophosphate poisoning due to insecticide exposure. So or organophosphate poisoning causes an increase in acetylcholine, uh, which will lead to these symptoms. And this is mostly due to an overactivation of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, let's stop right there. Before we talk more about organophosphate poisoning, we need to talk more about parasympathetic activation. Now, it's been said that the parasympathetic nervous system is associated with rest and digest, but that's a bit too simplistic. Let's go through this by system. How does the parasympathetic activation going to affect each organ? So first we have the gastrointestinal tract. So you're going to have increased muscle, you're going to have increased motility and tone. So basically you're getting more digestion and more transit through the intestines. Next, we have the bladder. You're going to have uh, contraction of the walls. You're going to have relaxation of the sphincter. In the eye, you're going to get meiosis. That's constriction uh, of the pupil. You're also going to get contraction of the ciliary muscle, which is going to lead to accommodation. In the lung, you're going to see smooth muscle contraction. In the heart, you're going to see decreased heart rate. You're going to have decreased contractility, just slightly. Uh, lacrimal glands, you're going to see a lot of stimulation of tears. In the salivary gland, you're going to get very watery secretions and more of it. You're gonna, in the uterus, you're going to see contraction of those muscles. In the penis, you're going to see erection. And remember our good mnemonic point and shoot. Parasympathetic is point, erection. And then for the clitoris, you're also going to see sort of a similar engorgement there as well. So if you look at these parasympathetic actions, then you start to see why Old McDonald is having his symptoms. His symptoms are not due to normal activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, but rather due to an excess of cholinergic activities. So one way to remember excess cholinergic activity is with the mnemonic dumbbell, so D-U-M-B-B-E-L-S-S. -S. Now let's go back to our list of parasympathetic activation, and now let's see what you get with too much stimulation. So you get diarrhea, you get urination, meiosis, you get bronchospasm, you get bradycardia, excitation of skeletal muscle, and CNS. Now don't worry, we'll come back to that one in a little bit because it doesn't quite fit our pattern. You get lacrimation, you get salivation, you get a whole lot of sweating. Now remember, sweating is also not fitting into this great pattern here, and we'll talk about that as well. 
Now one way I like to remember this is that everything becomes leaky. Extra fluid is going everywhere. Now you'll notice some blank areas in our parasympathetic list. Now don't get confused. Cholinergic excess is not exactly the same thing as excess parasympathetic activation. Cholinergic excess is another way of saying too much acetylcholine. Now let me explain what I mean. Now we just went through the parasympathetic actions and I don't remember seeing anything about sweating or excitation of muscles. In fact, we should probably see relaxation of muscles in general with parasympathetic activation. So how do we get an ex uh, excitation of skeletal muscle with too much acetylcholine? Well, what stimulates nicotinic receptors on skeletal muscle? Well, it's acetylcholine. So that's why you see muscle contractions or twitching with organophosphate poisoning. Now, what about sweating? Well, sweating is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system, but it uses muscarinic receptors to stimulate that sweating. Now, remember that most of the time, the sympathetic nervous system likes to use alpha and beta receptors, which then respond to things like norepinephrine. But these sweat glands are innervated with muscarinic receptors. And what stimulates muscarinic receptors? Again, acetylcholine. And what do we have too much of in organophosphate poisoning? Acetylcholine. So that's how we get the extra E and S in our mnemonic. Uh, they aren't parasympathetic, but they are simulated by acetylcholine. Now, if you're really smart, then you may argue, Dr. Lewis, the sympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine to stimulate the ganglion. And I would say, well, you're right. And you can see things like hypertension and tachycardia with organophosphate poisoning. But acetylcholine will stimulate both the ganglion and the receptor in the parasympathetic nervous system. Therefore, you're going to get a greater parasympathetic effect. And traditionally, test makers focus on the excess parasympathetic stimulation with organophosphate poisoning. Now, let's go back to our question and see what else we need to go through. Now, we've identified that this patient likely has organophosphate poisoning, but that's not, what the, uh, that's not really the answer to our question. Not only do we need to know the treatment, but we need to know the mechanism of action of the treatment. It's never straightforward, is it? Well, to figure this out, let's determine how organophosphates increase cholinergic activity. Well, organophosphates act by inhibiting acetylcholine esterase. And acetylcholine esterase is found in the synaptic cleft, and its job is to break down acetylcholine. Now, if you look at a synaptic cleft, you'll see a bunch of acetylcholine hanging out, and it stimulates muscarinic receptors. Now, acetylcholine esterase is also present, and it's breaking down acetylcholine, and it's breaking it down into choline and acetate. Now, if we don't have acetylcholine esterase, then we uh, get way too much acetylcholine and we get way too much stimulation of muscarinic receptors. So, looking back at the question again, we need to know the mechanism of action of the treatment of organophosphate poisoning. So, we have too much acetylcholine, and that acetylcholine is stimulating muscarinic receptors. So, one way to counteract this is to competitively bind muscarinic receptors. Now, what medication actually does this? Well, this is the mechanism of action of atropine, uh, which is the primary antidote of organophosphate poisoning. Now, another treatment option for organophosphate poisoning is praladoxine. So, praladoxine works by reactivating inhibited acetylcholinesterase. So, this sounds perfect. Praladoxine is actually working on our exact problem. However, this may not immediately improve our patient's symptoms. Therefore, in general, praladoxine is not given alone, but in conjunction with atropine. Okay, so that ends the patient profile. The highest yield stuff is the parasympathetic effects like bronchospasm, increased digestion, bradycardia, watery saliva, and stuff like that. Remember, old McDonald being poisoned by organophosphates where everything in his body is becoming leaky due to that inactivation of acetylcholinesterase. And finally, remember to treat old McDonald uh, with atropine and praladoxine. The atropine is going to block stimulation of those muscarinic receptors, and the praladoxine will help by reactivating acetylcholinesterase. So now let's move on to our next section. We're going to cover some more specific drug categories. We're talking about the cholinergic agonists themselves. And there are two types of cholinergic agonists. There are the direct agonist and the indirect. Now recall how we saw that the neuron uh, releasing acetylcholine into the postsynaptic cleft and was binding to the muscarinic receptor. Well, the direct agonist is just going to mimic the very same effects that of acetylcholine. They're going to bind directly to the muscarinic receptor. So here are some examples. So the first one is bethanicol, and it's used in patients who get a postoperative ileus or maybe a lot of urinary retention. Carbacol is used for glaucoma uh, by causing pupillary contraction. It'll also decrease uh, intraocular pressure. Pilocarpine is a potent stimulator of sweat, tears, and saliva. I actually had to use this on a patient of mine uh, who had parotid gland cancer. After treatment, he had almost no saliva, so his mouth was super, super dry. So we can use something like pilocarpine. It's going to improve the symptoms uh, and increase that saliva production. And luckily, his saliva actually came back after time. Methacholine, uh, historically, was used as a challenge test uh, for the diagnosis of asthma. We don't do that very much anymore. 
Uh, and next we have the indirect cholinergic agonists. So how do they work? Well, again, let's go back to our synaptic cleft. Remember that in that cleft, there was acetylcholinesterase, and its job was to break down excess acetylcholine. So the indirect cholinergic agonists will inactivate the acetylcholinesterase uh, and thus increase the amount of acetylcholine in the cleft, which leads to more stimulation of the muscarinic receptor. So this is exactly basically what we see with organophosphate poisoning. So what drugs do this? Well, the one you probably want to see most of is uh, things like neostigmine, and that's used in post-op and neurogenic ileus uh, with urinary retention, just like bethanicol. It's also used in the treatment of myasthenia gravis, and we'll talk about myasthenia gravis in just a second. It's also used to reverse the effects of neuromuscular blocking agents used in anesthesia. It's also good to remember that there are no CNS uh, penetration uh, with neostigmine as well. The next one is pyrotostigmine, uh, and it's used for myasthenia gravis for long-term treatment. Again, it does not get into the CNS. Edrophonium is used in the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis because it's very, very short-acting. You may hear this is referred to as a tinselin test. The brand name is actually uh, a tinselin, so that's why they call it that, but it's really just edrophonium is the name you need to remember. Physostigmine is used in glaucoma. It does enter the CNS. It's also uh, used in atropine overdoses. Echothiophate is a glaucoma medication, and donepazil is an Alzheimer's disease medication. So let's move on to Alzheimer's disease real quick. So Alzheimer's disease uh, have reduced cerebral production of choline uh, acetyl transferase, and that actually leads to a decrease in acetylcholine synthesis and in, an impaired cortical cholinergic function. Therefore, to help this apparent lack of acetylcholine, we actually started using medications that inhibit uh, acetylcholinesterases, and therefore that's going to increase the levels of acetylcholine in general. And the three big ones uh, that are FDA approved for Alzheimer's disease are donepazil, uh, galantamine and rivastigmine. Those are the three you really need to remember. At best, these medications provide a modest reduction in the rate of loss of cognitive functioning in that Alzheimer's uh, patient. Uh, another indication uh, that a patient has Alzheimer's disease is when you see amyloid deposits uh, in the gray matter uh, of the brain. So these are also called senile plaques, so remember that. Finally, let's talk briefly about myasthenia gravis. Uh, so what is myasthenia gravis? Well, it's a disorder with fluctuating weakness in the limbs, the eyelids, extraocular muscles, and potentially respiratory muscles. It's caused by antibodies uh, to the acetylcholine receptor. So on tests, you'll often see a question that describes a patient with worsening ptosis and diplopia uh, that worsens throughout the day. Now, you can diagnose this with the Tinselin test, which we just went over, which is just the brand name for edrophonium. I'd remember edrophonium. Uh, this test can be very dramatic. If you ever get a chance to see, it's really, really cool. I saw a patient uh, that almost was completely paralyzed who was given edrophonium, and in a matter of seconds, uh, she was moving and talking, was so thankful. It's, it's one of those really cool treatments that actually looks like a miracle. Uh, and what are some of the other things that you should know about myasthenia gravis? Well, it has uh, some thymic associations. Very interesting. About 50% is associated with, uh, associated with thymic hyperplasia. About 20% is associated with thymic atrophy and about 15% is associated with thymic tumor or thymoma. Uh, the most worrisome uh, condition is what we call a myasthenic crisis. And here we see rapidly progressing weakness, especially in the, uh, the respiratory muscles. So for treatment, we've already gone over uh, some of the indirect cholinergic agonists like pyrotostigmine and neostigmine. Remember that edrophonium again is that short acting one that's only used for diagnosis, but not for long-term treatment. This is an autoimmune disorder, therefore you can use immunotherapy agents like corticosteroids, azathioprine, cyclosporin. And also interestingly, uh, because there is some connection with the thymus, patients uh, with generalized myasthenia gravis will often have a thymectomy. And the last thing you can do is plasmapheresis, which will be uh, used to help filter out all those antibodies that are inhibiting the acetylcholine receptors. All right, that's going to be the end of the lecture part. Now it's time for that end of session quiz, so uh, answer all those questions and we'll go through them together. All right, first question here, how does the parasympathetic nervous system affect the following body structure? So we went through this before, hopefully we know it. So in the heart, you're going to get decreased heart rate, small decrease in contractility. In the eye, you're going to get uh, meiosis and contraction of the ciliary muscle. Salivary glands, increased saliva production and secretion, especially watery secretion. Bronchiolar smooth muscle, you're going to get contraction. Bladder, you're going to see contraction of the bladder wall and a relaxation of the sphincter. In the male GU, you're going to see erection. In the GI tract, uh, you're going to see contraction of intestinal wall, relaxation of the sphincter. And I just say increased digestion. Next question. What drug regenerates acetylcholinesterase after organophosphate poisoning? Remember, that's going to be praledoxine. And the next one, very similar, is what is the antidote for organophosphate poisoning? That's going to be uh, atropine, but again, also remember that pralidoxime can be used to help regenerate that acetylcholinesterase activity.
And last one here, which uh, uh, anticholinesterases are used in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease? Remember, that's going to be donepezil, galantamine, and rivastigmine. Okay, and then finally here, we do have a couple of rapid fire facts. Uh, first one here, amyloid deposits in gray matter of the brain. Uh, so these are called senile plaques, and that's going to be fine in Alzheimer's disease. And then if you see a drooling farmer, uh, you're going to see uh, that in organophosphate poisoning. All right, guys, so that's it for Farm Basics 1. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. How you doing? I'm Jimmy Snake Eyes, and I got a very important question for you. Which cholinesterase inhibitor is used to make the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis? Hey, that's right, edrophonium. Look at you saying the right answers and everything. All right, here's another one. Which cholinesterase inhibitor is used to treat myasthenia gravis? Right again, peridostigmine, which gets rid of myasthenia. You can also use steroids and immunosuppressants. And what surgical procedure is sometimes helpful? Thymectomy, because most patients with myasthenia have some kind of thymus pathology. All right, smart guy, get out of here. Back to the books. I said beat it. Scram. Why I oughta.